Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. Let's continue our worship by turning to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. There are, there should be Bibles in the chairs before you, behind you, under you. There should be. Sorry, I didn't look up the page number, what, it, what that would be. Uh, I think it was Graham, Billy Graham who said that uh, John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell. It's interesting. Uh, I listened to a lot of messages this past week, did a lot of reading, and also uh, took my notes and left half of them on the desk back there because I realized there's no way I'm getting through all of this, and I'm not going to rush, rush, rush to get through it. I, I don't want to do that today. But in singing that song, MacArthur says there are twin truths. And, and there's lots of them in the scripture, but one of those twin truths is the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And as we were singing that, we see the responsibility of man. We see the goodness of God, the love of God, the sovereignty of God, but we also see man's responsibility to respond to that gracious call. And so in our 
passage today, we're going to see those twin truths, the twin truths of the sovereignty of God and also man's responsibility, man's responsibility. So this is a continuation of our study last week as far as making our way slowly down through the gospel according to Luke. But we're not going to get very far today. We are going to read verses 10 or chapter 10 verses 21 through 24. And I thought, well, certainly we'll get to verse 22. And then I realized, no, we probably won't get to verse 22. Uh, but I plan to next week. And, and here's the reason why. Because there is so much packed in verse 21. And I also want us to, we, we, we find Jesus rejoicing. And I want to spend a little bit of time on the fact as his children, we ought to live. We are called to live with his joy and so we can learn from Jesus' example in verse 21 of living in the joy of the Lord. And as Nehemiah said, that, that the joy of the Lord be our, our strength. And, and so that is why we're not going to get real far. Well, I better start reading scripture or we're not going to get even verse 21 done. So Luke chapter 10, and this is a continuation uh, from last week where we left off with verse 20. Verse 21 down to verse 24. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. And the one to whom the Son wills to what? To reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eye, or blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. When, is the, when was the last time you thanked God that your eyes were open to his truth? That your ears, that one time which were dull of hearing, has now become open and attentive and responsive to God, to his calling, to his word. We take many things for granted, don't we? Maybe I'll just speak a little bit on verse 4, though, I don't, or verse 23, though, I didn't intend to. You know, I, I, I saw the word blessed on two different license plates this past week. And uh, one was a, uh, I'm, I'm going to say a, a mom, okay? Looked like it was. Window clings, stickers, you know what I'm talking about. Sort of told me that she's probably a mom, and she had blessed on the front of it. And I thought, good, praise God. The other one, other one before it was an old couple like my wife and I and and had blessed on it and, and figured, well, good, praise God. And in our house, there's this little brown plaque that I asked my wife about bringing it here and putting it on here. I preached it. Now, it probably wouldn't be a good idea. But anyhow, that's how I see it. I, I see my life as, as blessed. But why do I see my life as blessed? Well, I see it blessed because of what Jesus is saying in verse 23. And 24, because my eyes have seen the truth of Jesus. My eyes have seen my sinfulness. My eyes have been brought to the reality of, of the saving work of Jesus Christ. And by his, his power, by his spirit, by his sovereignty, and by his grace, I have been made alive. And because of that, I consider myself very blessed. Do you consider yourself blessed? And if you do, what is the source of that blessedness? Why do you consider yourself blessed? Is it because life's gone good? Because the bills are paid? Nothing's broke down right at the moment. Kids are getting along fairly well. Relationships aren't too bad. And so I figured I consider myself blessed. How do you look at blessed? And how do you look at joy? Those are things we'll talk about here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for time together this morning. And Lord, you know my heart. And uh, that is that I want to be obedient to you today. Uh, a lot prepared and and. and understanding that not enough time to share it. 
So I pray, blessed Spirit of God, that you would uh, have me share what you would have me to share. Father, I pray that you would give understanding. I pray that you'd use this service here today to call and to draw. I pray that your twin truths will take place in in this service, that your sovereignty uh, uh, will be seen and experienced. And also, dear God, that men will be responsive, men and women will be responsive to your calling and to your drawing. I pray that the gospel is very clearly conveyed today. Don't let me get in the way of that, Father God. I pray, blessed Spirit, that you would talk to us, that you would open blinded eyes, you would uh, make the dull of hearing to be able to hear very attentively and very clearly, that your Spirit and your Word would minister to our inner man, as I often pray, to our mind, our intellect, to our affection, our emotion, and to our volition, our will. And may we find today, as this service continues on, that there will be a surrendering of wills over to you. That there will be a matter of people falling humbly before you in submission and doing so with rejoicing and thanksgiving. God, use this for your glory. Use this for the furtherment of your kingdom. Use it to call this sinner home to you. And use it, Father God, to build up and encourage the believer. And Father, I pray for our brother Paul Homan. I pray safety in the journey to Danville. I pray that you would give doctors and wisdom, or doctors wisdom to treat. And God, we know that all healing comes from you, and we would ask your healing hand upon him. Uh, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So rejoicing, revealing, and blessings. A lot of Bibles just simply say above these verses, Jesus rejoices in the Father's will. And I, that's proper. That's, that's right. And so I, I want to ask you that question. Do you rejoice in the Father's will being accomplished? In any given day, whose will are you more interested in? Your will? Or God's will. And have you found it as a child of God walking more and more and more with Him that they are becoming to be merged? That your will is being more and more submissive and surrendered over to God to where I want what you want, God. I want what you want. And my will is, God, that you would be glorified. My will is that your kingdom would march forward. My will is to see others come to saving knowledge of Christ. Or is it a will of, this is my agenda today. These are my goals today. This is what I want to do. Those things are fine if it's for the glory of God and the kingdom of God. So, when we look at this passage of Scripture, we find Jesus rejoicing. I think a good, uh, a good verse to bring up is the one that we finished with last week as far as from Luke's text. So if we can have that, please. We see the disciples, the 70, if you will, rejoicing. How many of you remember that? And if you weren't here, it's understandable that, that you don't recall it. But they're rejoicing. I mean, they're, they're happy. They, I don't know if they gave high fives back then in that day, but they, they could have very well, you know. And, and so they're happy, they're rejoicing, they're rejoicing of seeing that the empowerment and the authority that was entrusted to them and the gospel message that was entrusted to them was going forward and it was having its effect. And, and they said, uh, and we read it there, that they said even... In verse 17, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And acknowledging it's not their power, it's, it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit working in them. And so they're thrilled about that. And they come back and they're rejoicing. Let's look at verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. 
Jesus says, great that you're rejoicing to see the kingdom march forward. It's great that you're seeing uh, the power of Satan crushed. It's great that you're seeing that. It's great to rejoice over that. It's good to celebrate the victories, right? There's nothing wrong with those things. Yesterday, we were over at uh, Black Machan and at what they used to call the Mid-State Airport. And uh, our two youngest daughters and I guess he's the, I don't know if he's the youngest son-in-law. It, it doesn't matter. Anyhow, they, they did a 20 mile or a 14 mile run, a little over a half of a marathon. And it was neat to see our two youngest daughters. It was neat to see Trav come through at about three hours and five minutes. Limping, but he came through, right? And, and the two younger daughters about three hours and a half, okay? But they're holding hands and they're coming through the finish line. And, and I was rejoicing in that. That was great to see. And I told Travis' father, I said, you know, you and I need to do this next year. And, and so we got a team. We got a plan. We're going to, it's going to be Ron and I in a wheelbarrow. And, and between two of us, and so when one of us just can't go anymore, we just dump in there and we go away. There were people that did a 30 mile. But, but th I was rejoicing in a victory. Now, they didn't win first place. I think Trav might have been close to middle. But they completed the course. And so it was, it was exciting to rejoice in that. And so they're rejoicing. The disciples are rejoicing because they're seeing the, the kingdom of God go forward. They're seeing the power of God on people's lives, the gospel message being received. And, and they're delighted. And Jesus says, that's great. But, but I want to tell you what I really want you to focus on and rejoice in. And that is that you're a child of mine and that your names are written in heaven. He's redirecting their rejoicing. Let me tell you, that, that little celebration yesterday and the victory, it's, it's, it's sort of over already. Uh, it, it is, in a sense. I mean, I can go back and look at pictures. But when our rejoicing is of eternal value, thank you, is of eternal value, it never wears out, does it? Each day it's a fresh reminder. And so I just want to encourage you to consider what are you really rejoicing in in life? Because Jesus directed them, not in the success of ministry, but really to rejoice in the fact that that you are a child of God and that your names are written in heaven. And, and rejoice in that. And, and, and this is a little bit of review and the only review for today. Here we see the sovereignty of God in this. Here's the, one of the twin truths of the sovereignty of God. Their names are written in heaven. I don't have the time to turn to it. Ephesians chapter 4, though, talks about I will look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So in your blessings, what you consider blessings of, of, in your life, are they by Christ, are they in Christ? Okay? And then in verse 4 it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without, without blame before him in love. That's the sovereignty of God. That's the sovereignty of God. You see, when was our names written in heaven? Our names were written in heaven before the foundation of the world. Our names are in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. God's eternal plan. Before any of it took place, it was already settled. It was already decreed in God's mind. Settled. And when we look at verse 11, and I want us to see that the, that the, the, the prospect, the, the for sure, assurance of heaven is not a matter of us doing. Verse 11 of, of Ephesians 1 says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And then we see this in verse 12 and 13, that we who first, as Ephesians 1, 
that we who first trusted in Christ, and so there's man's responsibility. The sovereignty of God, the twin truths running together. I looked at it this way. It's rather simple, but then consider the source. And so look at a day. A day is 24 hours, right? And in that day, there is daylight, and in that day, there is darkness. Those are twin truths. Those are twin realities that in one day, there are both. Both exist, right? If you thought that was simple, how about this one? But I bet you, you'll remember it for a while. How many of you had to do one of those assessment tests in the three words? Do you remember the three words? Uh, anyhow, that's, we don't need to talk about that. Here, here's one. You go to a lot of sinks. And I know you might have one of those center ones. Okay, we do too in the kitchen. But, but there's a hot and there's a cold. Twin realities. Hot, there's cold. Cold isn't hot and hot isn't cold. You can turn them both on, you have what? Lukewarm. But still, hot isn't cold and cold isn't hot. They're two completely different things. You try to harmonize them and you get lukewarmness. <laughs> you try to harmonize daylight and, and darkness, okay, you have dawn, you have dust, but there's, they're two separate things. And so we need to understand the sovereignty of God, the election of God, is a work of God. And so is the fact that man is responsible to the call of God upon his life. How many get that? Just a little wee bit at least. All right. And so they run together. And we get in trouble when we try to harmonize. One or the other will become compromised. Just accept the reality that God is sovereign, God calls, God draws, there is the, election, the elect, and yet man at the, full, at the same time is completely responsible for his actions and for his response to God. Now I'll leave it at that for there, or for this time, and we'll get to a little bit more of it yet today. So, what am I rejoicing in? What are you rejoicing in? Jesus says, here's what you're to rejoice in that you're a child of mine, that your names are written in heaven, and it's not your doing. It's God's doing, and therefore, take heart. Be encouraged. No one can pluck you from the Father's hand. Nobody can pluck you from the Son's hand. That we are secure in Christ, right? An inter eternal inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, reserved in glory for us, reserved in heaven, as Peter in his first epistle says. All right. Do you see life that way? As a child of God, do you see every day, a little review, that you are in a win-win situation? I may understand that. That as a child of God, you're in a win-win situation. Paul was talking about Philippians chapter 1, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live, let me live for your glory and your honor. You gave me another day, let me do my best to bring you glory today. You take me home, that's better yet. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul said to live is more fruitful, and that's how you and I ought to look at life. God, I want to be here as long as you want me to be here. And may my days be fruitful for your glory. But as far as my days, they're in your hand. And so help me to just be content with that. And to not let my contentment of my assurance in Christ and my assurance in heaven caused me to be apathetic or complacent. Right? All right, let's move on to the next verse, and we might not go any further than this verse as far as in Luke, but bring some other verses together to help us grasp what Jesus is saying here. If we may, there we go. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. I don't like the last part of that. I don't like that translation. And it might seem why. Well, how many to you seemed isn't real solid? 
it's like, mm, seems all right. How many understand what I'm saying? Seems isn't real solid of a word. But that's but in the Greek, the, the better understanding is this. And so I'm going to give you two other translations. This is the New American Standard and then the Amplified, which is basically a translating translation with commentary in it. And so it says in verse 21, at that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. We'll come back and talk about that, okay? Because some translations and some think that he was just, his inner person was rejoicing. Well, his inner person was rejoicing, but the Holy Spirit was bringing that rejoicing. And we as Christians understand rejoicing in the Spirit, right? All right. Let me read the Amplified. In that very hour, when church? That's where you say, that very hour. Okay. In that very hour, he was overjoyed and rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. There's nowhere else in the New Testament where this type of rejoicing is to this max. Okay? We need to understand that. And he said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things relating to salvation okay, from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants, the childlike and untaught. Yes, Father, for this was your gracious will and choice and was well-pleasing in your sight. So really, when we look at it, Jesus is in complete agreement. He is in full agreement. This is what is right in your sight. This is your good pleasure. This is your will being accomplished. And because of that, Father, I am rejoicing. You know, Paul says rejoice in the Lord how often? When everything goes your way. Is that how you remember that verse in Philippians 4? No, of course not. Rejoice always, and again I say, rejoice. That will come as we walk with Christ. And the will of God becomes more important to us than our own will. When we start living with the mentality of John the Baptist, I must decrease, but he must increase. When we start fading out of the picture and, and Christ is before us, it's like Paul, I am crucified in Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I probably had a couple mistakes in that, but you get it. Galatians 2.20. And so the desire is for God to be glorified. And so when we live with that understanding, we take great pleasure when we see his will being accomplished. I mean, again, let's face it. The, the disciples were rejoicing because they saw the power of God working in Jesus' name. Well, Jesus is rejoicing in the fact that the Father's will is being accomplished. And so let me just challenge you that or with that. When is the last time you rejoiced because you saw the will of God according to the word of God being accomplished? How many understand that question? That you're seeing God's will taking place. Whether that's somebody coming to saving knowledge of Christ, whether that's somebody's test strong testimony of God working in their life, and you're able to rejoice that God, praise, praise your name. You're being glorified through this person, and that's man's chief purpose. So that is your will. When people bring glory to God in their lives, his will is being accomplished, and we should be rejoicing in that. All right. Well, this verse is packed. If you look at it, and I should have put it in your bulletin. If I was a little smarter, I might have. But, but you can look at it in your Bible this is one of those verses where if you're a highlighter, if you're an underliner, just it would be a mess because you would have it highlighted, you'd have it underlined, and, and maybe have none of it. And yet today, I, I pray that some of it will really stand out to you. Co so let's look at it. Let's take some time on this verse. In that hour. What hour? That very same setting, right? We, we, uh, they came back rejoicing, <laughs> and they're rejoicing, and it's just like, hallelujah. And Jesus rejoices. He rejoices 
you know, and I think that's a, I, I, well, I'm going to let that one go. He rejoices in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, and I won't run down through all nine of them. Love and joy and peace. But if we just thought love, joy, peace. Joy. You and I cannot rejoice in the Spirit if we've not been born of the Spirit. I mean, understand that. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is just that. The fruit of the Spirit is just that. It's what the Spirit of God uh, works in us. He, 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 en he enables, He produces, and we live it out. And we know that the Spirit of God was in Christ as He ministered. L you're in Luke's Gospel. Go back to chapter 4 just real quick. And so He's at His home synagogue in Nazareth. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Hallelujah. Listen to the kids sing. Better coming out here screaming and crying, right? The, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Here, here, he found the place where it's written, and it was Isaiah, a couple different chapters in Isaiah, but Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Think of this for a moment. Remember when he was baptized? What took place? He came up out of the water. Right? Voice from heaven. Spirit of God came in the form of a dove. Right? And, and from the clouds. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So here's the anointed Christ rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Father's will is being accomplished. There's not a, this is a great triune verse here. It really is. I, I still cannot wrap my mind around people denying the Trinity. Well, the word's not in the Scripture. Not directly, it's not. But it's all throughout the Scripture of the triune God. And here's one of those verses. But in, jo in Luke 14, or Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, pro proclaim liberty to the captives, recover His sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book and for sake of time, verse 21, and he, be, and he began to say to them, to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hands. Aha. So here's the anointed one of God. And after the 70 come back and they're rejoicing, <laughs> Jesus is overwhelmed. Remember that word um, rejoice, that he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. It, it means this. And really, again, it's the only place in the Greek, if we could see it, that he's truly full of joy. He's overflowing with joy. His joy was so great that he had to express it, and he did so publicly. He's rejoicing that the Father's will is being accomplished. Can you be happy for others? Can you rejoice for others? To me, that's a true friend. That can really rejoice with your rejoice. You know, we're to we're to weep with those who weep. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're to bear other one another's burdens. We're to esteem others ahead of ourselves. But to just truly be happy for somebody else. And so here's the second person of God here. Here's the very Son of God, and that's what the Jews had the problem with. You call yourself the Son of God, making you God. That's blasphemy. So here's the second person of the Godhead rejoicing in the enabling and the powering of the third person of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and what does the Spirit of God move him to do but to thank and praise God? And so remember, the fruit of the Spirit is just that. The fruit of the Spirit is from God. And the fruit of the Spirit enables you and I to live lives that rejoice in the will of God being accomplished. You know, I was thinking about this. When you look at the fruit of the Spirit, and I can't get too many sidetracks here, when you, look, when you consider the fruit of the Spirit, realize that this world has counterfeits. Really, for all the fruit of the Spirit, if you look at it, this world has something else to lay aside it and say, here, God wants his children to experience his joy, right? 
Not circumstantial happiness, but true joy. What is joy? Joy is calm delight. Joy is a cheerfulness, a cheerful disposition. Joy is being glad. Joy to me is like the songwriter it is well had, had written, it is well with my soul. That's joy. That regardless of the outward circumstance, regardless of what is taking place in my life right now, and it could be falling apart in total chaos, there is a deep-seated peace and a calmness and a delight and actually even a cheerfulness. That's a gift of God. You can't muster that up yourself. People try to hide around behind facades. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's great when, when that's your line through your teeth, whether they be real or not. And so, no, no, no. The world has substitutes for things of God. There's no substitute. And so Jesus is rejoicing in the Spirit. And I pray that your rejoicing can be of the Spirit. And it can be of the Spirit if you're born of the Spirit. But it can't be if you're not born of the Spirit. How many, how many understand that? Remember, the quicker you nod, the faster I move on to the next point. Uh, yeah, you look like a bobbing thing in the back of a car window there, man. All right. So we, we see the Trinity here. And we see Jesus rejoicing because he is witnessing for himself. Because his disciples are seeing it and he is seeing it. What are they seeing? They're seeing the Father's will be accomplished. That will and that plan that was ordained before the foundation of the, of the earth is going forward. And that excites him. And it moves him, not only the rejoicing moves him to be thankful and to praise him. And so real thanksgiving and real praise comes from a joyful heart that God get, gives. Is there joy in your life? Is there a lack of joy in your life? Why is that? Why is that? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, it says, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, is there is the fruit of the Spirit. And so is it a matter of you not trusting God? Is it a matter of you not being mindful of His will and desirous to live in accordance to His will, which is found in His Word? Okay. Well, the other twin truth I want us to see here as we look at this verse, and we're, we'll leave that verse up here. He says this. Well, he mentions the Lord of heaven. I thank you. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. I thank you, Lord of heaven and earth. What does that mean to you and I? I think of a third day song, Lord of heaven and earth. How many know that song? Well, we think of that one. But for the Jew that day, and we always have to think of the then and there. All right. Take your mind there. Good interpretation of the scriptures begin with looking at the then and there and so the lord the lord of heaven and earth was a very known uh saying it was a jewish expression well known then and it meant the single the supreme and only god of the universe the true living god macarthur says he is the god of abraham isaac jacob the creator God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is no other. And there is no other. There's no other. And so he is the sovereign one. Let me read to you a few verses. Melvin read a couple verses this morning. And I want you to consider this. Again, really emphasizing these twin truths of the sovereignty of God and man's responsibility. So I'm just going to read these to you real quick. Don't Please don't try to turn and find them. Uh, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations, Psalm 33. Psalm 115, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Verse, or Psalm 135, verse 5, for I know that the Lord is great and our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. And there are some people, the proud, the arrogant, and many of them being wise, worldly speaking, intelligent, worldly speaking, that really takes issue to that. 
that God does whatever he pleases. How many of you trust that whatever God pleases is perfect? That whatever God pleases does never run contrary to his attributes, to his character. That whatever pleases God is what is righteous and what is holy and what is loving and what is gracious and what is merciful, just to name a few. So I, when I read this psalm earlier, or last week, later in the week, and I was reading my psalm for the, for the morning, and I came across that in Psalm 135, I said, wow, that goes with the service or with the message, for I know that the Lord is great. I know that. Psalm 135, verse 5 and 6. And our Lord is above all gods, because there really aren't any other gods. They're just false deities, but they're, uh, but they're not real. And in verse 6, then, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and earth, in the seas, and in all the deep places. Do we always like what he does? No. Do we always agree with what he does? No. But just think how foolish that is, even. And you can read about this in Romans 9. I can't take the time to do it. But here's this small little brain, this, this finite individual trying to comprehend an infinite God who knows the beginning from the end, who has all things planned out before any of it even transpires. That's beyond you and I. Proverbs 21.30 says, There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. Well, I rest in the fact that nobody's going to thwart the Lord's doing. Nobody's going to rise up and, and, and take him off of his throne. Satan tried that, Isaiah 14. And it's not going to happen. My hope and trust is on the sovereign God of, of all things, heaven and earth. And that's what Jesus is excited about. That his Father's will, the Lord of heaven and earth, in which he is the Son of, in which he is the second person of that Godhead, that there's no stopping him, that he is sovereign. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. That should not scare you. That should cause you to reverence him, but it also should cause you to, be, to have joy and assurance in the depth of your heart. Right? Who are you trusting in, Scott? The sovereign one, the only sovereign one. There, there really is no other. And if I put my trust in anything else or anybody else, I'm just going to be dis disappointed in the long run, if not before. But not, not when my hope and trust is in the Lord of heaven and earth. King Nebuchadnezzar was very humble, Daniel 4.35, and he said this, think of that, the king of Babylon saying, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will. Among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nobody can do that. I will read a verse or two from Romans 9, verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. And then Romans 11, he says, Oh, the depths and riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who can know the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him? And it shall be repaid to him. For all of him and through him to him are all things. To him be glory forever. That's the sovereignty of, the God, of God. That's the Lord of harvest. And so that's who Jesus is rejoicing in. And then he moves on and says this. You have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. What does that mean? Wise in their own eyes. Prudent in their own eyes. Who did he have in mind here? The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. The, the spiritual elite of the time. People who were trusting in their own righteousness. And Jesus is grateful because, Father, it is well-pleasing to you. And, it, and it's a manner of, 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 of justice 
that those who reject you, those who trust in their own righteousness, you don't want to know this? You won't know this. You won't respond to this? No, you won't respond to this. Jesus is rejoicing because those who reject Christ, those who are trusting in their own righteousness, Jesus has then hidden it from them. And he's rejoicing that the Father has hidden it from them. We need to understand that the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's not that he takes pleasure in judicial uh, judgment. But God who is all wise, who is all holy, who is all loving. It is well pleasing to him. To those who are trusting in their own righteousness, their own intelligence, their own means of salvation. To hide the truth from those who reject the truth. The sovereignty of God, the responsibility of man. Twin truths. The gospel goes forth, they reject. It's your responsibility. The gospel goes forth, they don't want to hear it. Their eyes are blind to it. So a judicial blindness continues. But here's what he also says. He says this in that same verse. You have revealed it to the babes. In other words, to those who understand. We think of a baby, we think of something that is so dependent upon its parents. So dependent on others for help. So trusting, so vulnerable, so in need. And you realize how many people don't carry themselves that way. I don't need God. I don't need anything. I'm self-made and I don't need this. And Jesus says, then you won't have it. There is always the element of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And so those who see themselves as babes, who see themselves in need of forgiveness, in need of righteousness, who understand, I can't do anything to make myself right with God. There is nothing I can do to earn heaven. I understand my sinfulness. I understand that there is nothing in me, in of myself, that would ever look to God. That God is the initiator of our faith. That God does call, that God does draw, and he, he calls us to come to him. You know, in Matthew's gospel, and, and we're running out of time, he says these same words, and then he says, come to me. It lays out God's sovereign plan, and the invitation is yet there. It's right there. We sang uh, basically John 3.16. That whosoever will. Jesus told Nicodemus earlier in that chapter that unless you're born, from, born of the Spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. That's God's sovereignty. That's his will. That's his determination. That unless you're born of the Spirit of God, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And then the responsibility of man, that whoever believes in him shall not, what, church? Perish, but have everlasting life. So the, the twin truths, the twin realities that are there, that God calls and draws, and man responds. Or man, and that response could be rejection. Let's focus on this as we close this up, and I pick this up more next week. And that's this. I want us to understand that we are to live in the joy of Christ. Uh, next, go down to uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Just real quickly, almost like rapid fire here. here here's God's sovereignty working again. And, and here's man's responsibility. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, 
that God, the true and living God, the Lord of heaven and earth, right? Who has shown in our hearts, it's him that has done that, to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God, how? In the face of Jesus Christ. Has that? Have you been brought to that realization? God bringing revelation to your darkened heart, your darkened soul. Uh, giving that light of the knowledge of the, of the glory of God. How? Through Jesus Christ. I had a brother call the other day, tell, tell me his sister was doing better. And he, he says, I know this. There's a lot of things I don't know. He says, but I know this. That I am to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else is going to be taken care of. I said, that's exactly right. And so, we seek him because he has called us and drawn us. And he has brought light. God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Knowledge of salvation through faith in Christ. Now, next one qu quickly. There's the screaming. Uh, we know that we are of God. Do you know that? Do you know that today? You, you should know that without a shadow of a doubt. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Romans 8, Galatians 4. But in this passage, the Apostle John, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. That's the condition. And guess what? You and I were once there. Maybe you're still there. I don't know that. Is there light within, the light of Christ? Or is there a substitute, a counterfeit of this world being your enlightenment, your illumination, your knowledge? We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know, I love this no, no stuff, and we'll talk more about it next week, Lord willing. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal God. And where did this knowledge come from? It came from God. Where did the light come from? It came from God. That's his sovereign work. Your part and my part is responding to that. And so Jesus lived with rejoicing. He was the man of sorrows. This is a paradox to me. Man of sorrows, Isaiah 53. And this is the only time in Scripture that we see him openly and publicly and with exceedingly or with exceeding joy rejoicing. Not saying it didn't happen other times, but the only place in Scripture during his earthly ministry that we see this. And so here's just a few things as I close. Learn to live with Jesus as your joy. Learn to live with Jesus as your joy. In other words, rans have, ask the Spirit of God to ransack your mind. God, when it really gets right down to it, what's my joy? What, 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 it, what is it? Am I not allowed to take pleasure in other things, Scott? Yes, absolutely, you can take pleasure in other things. But, but where is your joy? What is the source of that? Is Jesus there? Or are you just going with the circumstantial happiness it's like riding a roller coaster. Learn to live with Jesus as your joy. Learn to live with the Holy Spirit given joy instead of circumstantial temporal happiness. I, I don't want that. That's the world's counterfeit. I, I don't want that. Next truth. And we only have one more after this. Jesus said this. The night he was betrayed, the night he was... Uh, would be soon taken. If you keep my commandments, how you, you said to me, Pastor, learn to live with Jesus as your joy. How do I go about that? Here you go. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments, abide in his love. I'm saved by grace. That's all that matters. If you're really saved by grace, you're going to want to love Jesus and keep his, his teachings. Th that's evidence. That's evidence of a transformed life. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be what? 
I mean, we all go through difficult things. And we have sorrows, no doubt. And there's times when it's just tears, 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 and we, we can't seem to find joy. But it's there. And a long face on a Christian should be, it should be the exception and not the rule. Right? It should be the exception. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so let's, how do I learn to live with Jesus as my joy? Jesus said that these things I've spoken, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. Do you seek him? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Do you cry out to him, God, I, I'm being true to your word. I'm trusting Jesus. Let me experience your fruit. Let me experience that. It, it's for me, and you, you, you want me to experience. So let me experience. And, Lord, help me to see what's robbing me of my joy. Help me to see what I've replaced your fruit with from this world and repent of it and get rid of it and, and rely on you and experience your fruit. And then lastly, how do we learn to with, live with Jesus as your joy? Here, here's how we do it. Lastly, and I won't comment on this. I don't have time. But it says looking on to Jesus. So first of all, my, my focus is on him. And every time my focus is off, and I start seeing myself going like this. No, no, no. Spirit of God, help me to readjust and, and fix my eyes on Jesus. Looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one who began it. He's the one who will complete it, right? He, he, he's only, the only one that, uh, in whom we are saved. The only way to the Father. And look how he carried himself. Look how he carried himself those 33 years and particularly the last three years of his ministry. The man of sorrows carried himself with joy, who for the joy that was set before him, he could see the finish line. He could see the father's plan come into culmination. He could see it. So for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He endured the cross. Can't you see glory, my friends? Can't you see it out there? Live in joy. Endure this life through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't let the hard race in front of you get you down. Look at the prize that's before us. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And when it was all done, he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And when this weary life is over, you and I will do the same. We'll sit down before our Lord. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit would take inventory of our, our lives that you would reveal to your children what have we allowed to become substitutes for your fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Whose will are we really living for? What do we really see as the joy of our lives? Father, do a work in our lives. Continue to work in our lives. Continue to conform us more and more into the image of your Son, and less and less of the ways of this world. For your glory, in Jesus' name.
Father, I thank you for the reality that your children live with, that Jesus is our Savior. And because of that, we are right in your eyes. We have been justified, we have been sanctified, we have been glorified. And, and so the, the, the knowledge, the, the comforting knowledge that uh, when this life is over, uh, we will be with you. And so as Jesus taught his disciples to rejoice that their names are written in heaven. May we rejoice knowing our names are written in heaven. And there's nobody that's going to cross our names out. But Father, we also pray that you would help us to live with a desire for your will to be done. And as we see Jesus' example to rejoice, to be exceedingly glad, overwhelmed with joy because your will is being accomplished as life goes on, as time goes on. And, and Father, we just pray that you would help us to be mindful of, of what really brings us joy. Is it counterfeits from this world, or is it a result of the fruit of your Spirit working in our lives? So we pray that you would do inventory, you do a work in our lives, and just help us to keep looking to Jesus, for he alone is our author and perfecter of our faith. In his name we pray. Amen.